Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 16, going over a standard deck tech for a Niapod. This is a hell of a fun deck to play. I strongly recommend giving it a try. It's a very flexible, fun deck in the current environment. I played it recently at the Pro Tour Qualifier in Seattle about a month ago and did rather well. 6, 2, and 1, so 19th out of 225. Uh, there are several strong cards in this deck that I'd like to highlight. First, uh, Zealous Conscripts won me several games. The ability to grab one of my opponent's permanents, often a titan or a zombie, and attack them with it. Swung games around. Having a birthing pot in play with zealous conscripts was even better, because then I could sack their high-priced permanent to go get something large, like Elish Norn. Um, Elish Norn also allowed me to lock out several decks. This is one of the best answers out there to lingering souls or tokens, or even competing pod decks. Being able to make all of your creatures larger and theirs smaller is just great. Uh, Throg Tusk was really, really good against the aggro matchups. Being able to pod into him rather quickly swung the life total back up and allowed me to stabilize. I was extremely happy with him and look forward to playing him more as the cycle rotates. Uh, Gavney's Township, though, was also one of the strongest cards in the deck. Often you can put two or three permanents in play, or one creature out versus a control deck, and they have to deal with that single creature as it gets larger and larger. It really allows you to move from a control deck into an aggro deck. And that's one of the things that I really want to emphasize about this deck, is that the deck itself has the ability to either be a control deck or an aggro deck. Now, I have to give some credit here to Durwald, who deck list I used at the Pro Tour Qualifier. Um, I was very happy with this deck list overall, although I did make some improvements for the game day event that I played a few weeks later. But the deck is really a mid-range deck against your tempo-y aggro decks. You're able to play a control game, you're able to gain some life, and then you're able to hit back really hard. Against those late game control decks, you get to be the aggro deck and you start attacking very quickly. One of the cards that I was most divided over in this deck was Thalia. Thalia works really well against the decks that require a lot of instants and sorcery, so when you're playing the aggro deck, Thalia is great to drop out uh, when you are the aggro deck. Thalia is great to drop out there and to slow down the control decks by a turn or two. Where I was a little bit surprised is she's not as strong versus Delver as I thought she would be, especially if they're running one of the larger 20, 21, 22, 23 land drop versions of Delver. If they're playing a 16 to 18 land drop version, she's very strong. But a gut shot only costs one mana and kills her right away. She did not do as much against Delver as I was hoping. She's also a little bit tough to deal with in your own deck when you really need a pod out, because it does slow your own pod down. So in some situations, I was not happy having her out. I love her in Legacy. I'm still a little bit divided about her in Standard. Now, uh, there's a really good report out there from Star City Games over how well this deck works and that was put together by Ari a few weeks ago and I recommend you definitely check that out if you would like some more focused on how to play this deck. Um, I ended up making some minor changes to this to play in a game day over at Card Kingdom. Uh, the big things that I changed here was I really hated the heroes of Bladehold. There wasn't one time when I was happy to have them out on the board. Also, sighting them in with a large number of caverns is very difficult. You don't want to put two caverns on white. The double white's a little bit tough to deal with in this deck. I would much rather have had a bonfire here. I'm also a bit more of a control player, so I moved over to a little bit more control-based cards in this deck. Acidic Slime is one of those things that works really well against the current trading post deck and it can be an answer to a lot of different sideboard things. Also, Phyrexian Metamorph just adds a level of depth to this deck. When you can copy anything on either side, your ability to pod from 3 to 4 gets a lot more complicated, but it gives you some incredibly interesting outs in dangerous situations. I also went for the Combust, because I believe it's a little bit stronger versus Delver than Crushing Vines. A lot of the Delver decks are still playing counters, and Bonfire of the Damned is just amazing in the mirror match, and 
you really need it early against some of the aggro decks. So going up to two in main deck or two in main deck and one in sideboard is definitely recommended. If you would like to try to take this deck one step further, there is now a combo kind of version of this deck out that is a four color pot. It moves around the mana base a little bit, uh, moves a little bit less away from the control area. And, but it's a lot more complicated to play. Um, Ari Laxa actually played this and won a Pro Tour qualifier with it after writing that earlier article that I mentioned on Niapod. But let me see if I can give you a little bit of a taste of what this next level kind of combo pod deck looks like. The board states that you can get into allow you to pod all the way up the chain from just one or two creatures in play. So let's look at what happens for a second. If you've got a few forests in play, an Elvish Visionary, and a Birds of Paradise, you use your birthing pod to sack the Elvish Visionary to go get a Deceiver Exarch. The Deceiver Exarch then untaps a permanent when it comes into play, your birthing pod. You use the birthing pod again to sacrifice the Birds of Paradise to go get a Phantasmal Image. You use the Phantasmal Image to copy the Deceiver Exarch, which then untaps the pod again. You sacrifice the Phantasmal Image, which is now a three casting cost uh, converted mana because it has copied the Deceiver Exarch to go get a Restoration Angel. The Restoration Angel brings back in the Deceiver, gets the Deceiver Exarch to flash, untapping the pod. You then pod, then pod the, the Restoration Angel to go get a Zealous Conscripts. Zealous Conscripts, you target your Birthing Pod to untap your Birthing Pod. You pod the Zealous Conscripts into a Sun Titan, which then allows you to get back the Phantasmal Image or, and copy something such as the Deceiver Exarch to untap the pod and continue up the chain, or to copy the Sun Titan, getting something else out of your graveyard, like another Phantasmal Image, and continue this chain. And then from that point on, you can take that copy of the fan Phantasmal Image and continue podding through the chain in some way, um, or you can pod the Sun Titan into an Elish Norn, which takes you from a board state of nearly having an elf and a bird in play to basically having any one or two creatures out of your pod chain all the way on up to Elish Norn in play. This type of a transition does make the deck a lot more complicated to play as you're often playing with phantasmal images, although I also like to have in this type of a more combo oriented control the Phyrexian Metamorph in there. Um, if you would like to play on the more aggro side, I really recommend that earlier deck list that has the focus on image blade splicers and early beatdown. Uh, this is a very different type of Niapod, actually four color pod deck. Either way, whether you want to play beatdown or you want to play the kind of combo control, this is a deck that's going to be very viable for the next few weeks, and I recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun to play. Thanks, this has been Brian Rowe with Anaya Pod Deck Tech for Standard.